All right, so I guess we can start with introductions. I'm Kevin Yang. Um, I'm the director of operations for Hack for the People. Uh, some of you watching might have uh, seen me at opening ceremonies uh, yesterday. And so I guess uh, when it comes to AI, as I said earlier, I'm, a, I, I'm simply a, a hobbyist uh, in the field. I, I like uh, dealing with small embedded systems and then trying to run machine learning models um, onto like really small chips, basically. And then Hobson, if you would like to give an introduction of yourselves. Sure, I'm Hobson Lane, I'm CTO and co-founder of Tangible AI. Looks like Maria, my co-founder, has joined us as well. Um, we are building AI and uh, conversational AI in particular for uh, nonprofits around the world. And I've, um, I got into this field only really 10 years ago when it became a thing. Uh, before that, I was doing less, um, less altruistic things with, um, with uh, automation and, and, and robotic systems. Right, I guess uh, we can start with just like, I'll start uh, probing around um, about uh, yourself. So how did you uh, start like programming and getting into, into the field? So what like really brought you into the field of data as well as AI? Well, <laughs> I've been in it, uh, I guess, as a, uh, on, a, on a hobbyist level, sort of like you, since I was probably 10 years old, I was programming a computer to play text adventure games with me just to entertain myself. I was just fascinated by the, the concept of being able to tell a machine what to do. And then, um, cause my little brother never would. And so um, uh, this was, uh, so I, that's how I got into it, um, working on, and it's, it's surprising that uh, we, had a, we had a lot of fun recently actually with, um, on one of our projects, Maria and her um, coworker on that project are building a, a chat bot that actually incorporates a, a text adventure for, um, for uh, students in Myanmar, children in, in Myanmar, to help uh, educate them on um, child trafficking and how to avoid that. All right, uh, and then I, I guess just to start getting like a background on uh, your company, Tangible AI. So, what what's the backstory um, about about Tangible AI? Like, how did it uh, get started? Um, and then, what exactly uh, does Tangible AI do? So Tangible AI is um, Maria's creation uh, about uh, towards the end of last year, she put together this, uh, this company um, based on her experience in the nonprofit sector. She has a lot of contacts and a lot of uh, passion about serving that, uh, that community. Um, and she sees a, a real need for, for natural language processing and uh, AI and technology in that, in that space. And then I ran into her at a meetup in San Diego, um, Python user group, uh, study group, where we were, and she asked me some questions about uh, chatbots and NLP. And, and before long, we were, uh, we were, we, I realized that, wow, we're doing the exact same stuff. So let's, uh, and so she invited me to join her on, on that project. So uh, like I said, so we're, we're, we're working on chatbots for people like, um, uh, organizations in, in Myanmar and Nepal um, and uh, that uh, we're doing uh, mostly chatbots that are relatively deterministic and not a lot of AI, uh, but um, they are helping um, with behavioral nudges essentially for, uh, for humans or, or to help them um, uh, overcome everything from uh, imposter syndrome and and also of course to deal with much more serious issues like like child trafficking and how they can um, the sort of coping mechanisms they can use to and and how to uh, deal with situations in which they don't feel comfortable and um, there are um, and then uh, we also have um, a data science sort of wing in our, in our company where we work on um, data sets like the uh, India Family Health Survey that comes out annually. Um, they have a lot of data and it's very unclean. There's a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of incentives for various regions in India to misreport some of those statistics around anemia and, uh, and uh, sexually transmitted diseases. But we, um, we so we, we obtained that data and helped the organizations there mine through that data to help find some potential interventions that might help in, in the rural India where anemia is 
quite an epidemic. Um, you know, there's more than 50% of, of, of women and children are affected by anemia. And then, um, and, um, and we are also working on chatbots for uh, educations for colleges and um, uh, things like um, uh, acting as my TA for at UCSD, where I, I teach courses on data science for healthcare. And, um, and also um, we're working with a company in Toe Labs that's developing um, AI for monitoring and optimizing the production of insects and fertilizer uh, for the disposal of food waste in the US. So uh, helping uh, try to deal with the protein, the, the looming protein crunch that's going to uh, envelop us all if we, if we don't have uh, better protein sources. In the, in the long term. For, this is not actually for human consumption, though. This is for, um, for fish consumption. So the insects would, would replace fish as a fish food. Um, typically, they grind up fish for, um, for fish food. Yeah, um, on that note, with uh, what you're saying about your work at Intel Labs, um, under LinkedIn, I, I did some LinkedIn stalking before this. Um, <laughs> but uh, it says that you've worked uh, at multiple jobs like throughout, uh, throughout the years. And so you've worked at MidCurrent, uh, Mansev, Deep Canopy, uh, Deep Canopy, and even Intel. So could you uh, tell us about some of your experiences working at these various tech companies and then what you've learned and then how each uh, company does things uh, a little differently in the field of data as well as um, in AI? Well, that's a, that's a good question. That's a, that's a, that, that could take uh, all night, but, um, but uh, I'll just start with uh, Sharp Labs. They uh, helped them develop systems for uh, mining their natural language data sets to, um, to determine within their tech notes on their televisions repairs to find common patterns that they could use to then correct for that was able to save them a couple million dollars until they decided to shut down that production light, uh, pipeline in, in the US and in uh, Mexico. So they no longer produce televisions anymore because of this uh, relatively simple fix that they, uh, it was obvious that you know, if someone coming in from the outside can find something like that um, in their production processes, they, they, were, they were a little bit behind the times in terms of getting data science into their world. Um, for Intel Labs, I worked on a, a system to um, um, an ankle bracelet for monitoring and doing biometrics on humans, just like a Fitbit, but this was uh, more, um, more detailed and more medical to um, to identify supination and pro, uh, pronation, uh, various, uh, basically turning your toes in or out, landing with your toes too hard, landing with your heels too hard to help um, dynamically coach people on their running style or their, their walking style. Um, uh, so there, that was a really innovative product where they were, and you'd be excited about this, Kevin, they were embedding it into an ankle bracelet. So the actual AI was occurring, the actual neural network was accomplished within, um, within the Fitbit. They have a, a unique uh, neuron chip that they were developing at the time. Um, I think they've gotten out of that business because, but it was designed to be extremely low power and yet be able to accomplish. It has some really fancy math that was going on inside that Fitbit, but obviously with the growth in GPUs and all of the, the models being out in this other world with a different kind of math going on, they, they never really were able to, to keep up and, um, and maintain that as a product. From what I understand, I haven't followed them since. But then, um, uh, subsequent to that, I, I, I actually before that, I worked at a company called Building Energy, helping forecast uh, power consumption um, to, and um, it's actually one of the elementary data science problems that you might run into in your, uh, in your course. You, you can find this as being a, a very valuable. So like the Zillow, this estimate, estimating price, that's a common problem done on Kaggle and elsewhere. And if you're estimating uh, energy consumption for buildings, you can use that in a, a pretty unusual way like we were for commercial buildings, we were recommending retrofits. So um, based on all of those individual coefficients on all your different parameters, you can decide which, uh, which are the most cost effective retrofits. You can do changes to the building to affect the, uh, the energy consumption. Of course, you could do the same for, uh, for price as well if you wanted to do a, a renovation to improve your sale costs. Um, so those are fun models that your, your the people there might uh, enjoy. Um, I could go on. There's, uh, I think, about six more companies where I've done uh, various additional things. So you just tell me when to when to stop and when to move on. Um, I, I guess that's that's a good, uh, I guess, like quick uh, quick summary of of some of the the work you've done uh, over the years. 
And I guess uh, with what you said earlier about using chatbot technology in Myanmar, uh, can you, could you ex uh, go into a little deeper uh, about that and then how, because uh, I know chatbots, uh, if you've ever gone to any uh, tech company's website and then usually hear that little ping um, and then you see in the bottom right corner, uh, there's, there's a little chatbot that's asking you questions. Um, and so that's definitely gotten rid of like type, for, uh, not type forms, but like websites and those uh, pretty, pretty ugly Google forms that a lot of companies used to have uh, to get data. But uh, using uh, chatbots in Myanmar is definitely uh, unique and then using it in, um, I would say, uh, more third world country um, situation. So it, that's definitely something interesting. And if you could go a little deeper into that usage, that'd great. be great. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about um, some of the domestic stuff we're doing. And, and then I'll let Maria, perhaps, if you don't mind, uh, speak to the Myanmar and uh, Nepal projects. She's much more familiar with that. Um, she's the CEO of Tangible AI, um, and she's managing those two projects. The, um, uh, the work we're doing domestically, though, we're using a chatbot to onboard new interns at, at Tangible AI. So uh, we're going to have an application process that involves a chatbot, an interaction with a chatbot. So it's a lot more, um, we'll get a lot more, the, the funnel, uh, as marketeers like to call it, will be a lot more productive uh, with a chatbot than it would be with the type form. Uh, likewise, we we actually have a chatbot that will interact with the new interns daily for a period of, I think, 30 days during their their onboarding to actually go help them through the process of um, getting Git up and running and configured, getting getting all their software development environment working, and getting up to speed on our processes and style guides and all that kind of stuff. So I don't have to. I'm really looking forward to that. We um, during the summer we didn't have it for our interns, but uh, for the fall quarter we're going to have it. It's going to be a, an exciting development. Maria, could you speak more to, um, to chatbots and how they can help in uh, third world countries? Sure, hi Kevin, hi everyone. Uh, sorry to crash the party uh, and it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, so yeah, just to, to give a very brief overview of what Hobson was talking about. So um, actually chatbots are getting more and more popular in the developing settings. And one of the major reasons for that is because Facebook is so popular um, in a lot of um, in a lot of the countries, it actually makes uh, it actually makes the distribution and reaching people uh, much easier. Um, so, as Hobson mentioned, one of our flagship projects that we're working on right now um, is a project in Nepal where we basically educate Nepali youth um, about how to about the dangers of human trafficking and how to avoid it by both you know just providing the right information and you know danger signs of someone that might be a trafficker uh, and even interactive stories that kind of prepare the use for the situation that they might encounter um, and we actually are very glad to work with another organization that has actually been using chatbots in myanmar for more than four years at this point um, and we are helping them to onboard their natural language processing, but their chatbot has already interacted with more than 150,000 um, small, small scale entrepreneurs in Myanmar. So people who run fruit stands or tuk-tuks and it basically educates them about the opportunities of how to join the banking sector, right? How to open an account, how to apply for a loan or for a credit line. And the amazing thing about it is again, uh, the interactive portion of um, uh, the interactive aspect of, of um, chatbot uh, interaction where you can really kind of create this back and forth uh, process, conversational process of consuming uh, information is something that can turn, you know, very boring uh, information into something that people are excited about and share with their friends. Wonderful. Uh, that that uh, brings me, I guess, to another thing about about chatbots. I guess um, I, I was working on a project uh, for like a hackathon project in Mexico. Uh, well, not in Mexico, online. This was during. Uh, this is like a few months ago, um, and so definitely chatbots have helped startup uh, startups, but also small business companies a lot. Um, and so, could you speak on, uh, I guess, that impact to these to these smaller companies? I know. Um, you said that it brings that one-on-one -on -one, uh, feel to to uh, to uh, basically collecting information to make it more um, human, I, I guess. Yeah, um, 
uh, I have some thoughts on Maria, feel free to jump in. But um, the whole concept of AI has really democratized the world of business and a lot of a lot more people are empowered with the tools of AI in general, not just chatbots uh, and natural language processing to mine through massive amounts of data to, to, to comb through Twitter feeds and monitor their own uh, reputation online. These small businesses are, or manage their, their Facebook accounts or whatever, um, all uh, it helps them automate it. And many of these tools that, uh, especially the ones that we're using for chatbots are, um, have been productized in a way that even small businesses can configure and, um, and even program those chatbots without having any programming experience at all. And certainly no natural language processing or AI um, uh, experience uh, and data science experience. Uh, this is done through graphical interfaces and graphical programming interfaces and, and plugging up of APIs that are, uh, many of them are free for, you know, uh, Dialogflow and Lex and, and typical other systems online for, for accomplishing all the hard stuff that, um, so that, that we do uh, to help. Um, so, and yeah, so that it, the just AI automation software, especially free and open source software has been really an empowering for, for force for the individual as well as the small business out there. All right, uh, Ray, do you have something to add or? No, I think, I think Hobson uh, summarized it exactly right. I think we, what we see is that really um, in the recent years, you know, this, the, the spread of AI was so profound and ubiquitous. And one of the things that we are trying, one of the messages that we are trying to get, especially to, to the nonprofit sector is that, you know, AI is not the future any longer. If AI is here, it's accessible to everyone. You don't need a PhD in data science to build those applications. Um, and we really believe it. We really believe that AI should be affordable and accessible to everyone. And, you know, our particular work is about making it accessible and affordable to people that, you know, solve those important problems out there. Um, but the thing is that really um, everyone can, can, can go into this field today um, and, uh, and make a difference. I guess on that note, Maria, um, I, I was going to say this to the end. Uh, but since uh, this is for a hackathon and then many of the attendees uh, in this call are students, uh, how could students uh, like in high school all the way to, uh, to undergrad or, or grad school uh, get into the, uh, the field of AI um, and then also uh, keep making companies that, that uh, really work in the, in the field with, with AI and then uh, chatbots, et cetera? So that was for you, Maria, but I'll, I'll take it briefly. The, um, uh, the, the open source contributions, especially at hackathons, is a wonderful way. I don't know, like the big conferences like Python, um, PyCon, uh, they always host about a week where you can get free food and pizza for a week if you just participate in the hackathon and, uh, and do anything on any Python open source project. That's a great way to, to work with a team build uh get 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 familiar with the, the tools and also to if depending on your your level of a of software skill also working your way up to um to actual ai and 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 data science in many many cases scikit learn all the, the core packages that we use in, in data science from tensorflow to keras to um uh scikit learn uh, PyTorch. These are all open source packages that um, that you can work your way through from from documentation all the way up to core efficiency improvement and optimization and new algorithms. And so it's just a matter of um, the getting into it. <laughs> you just got to do it. Uh, just just participate. Be show up and um, and before long you'll be you'll you'll be you'll be amazed at yourself um, at, at what you can accomplish if you just contribute to a few open source projects. Right, and I guess um, like if you if you look at me right now with my, with my webcam, uh, you you can probably see that the that that I'm like pretty pretty dark right now, and uh, there's like no light. But it's actually bright as day uh, in my room right now. So I think my webcam is having some issues. Uh, but uh, moving on, so just like if if you search up like the amount of data that gets produced every day, uh, there there's some numbers. Uh, by, uh, so in an article by Blazon, 
um, a tech, uh, I guess, newsletter, you could say. Uh, they said that uh, we produce 2.5 quintillion bytes of data each and every day. Um, and so, Hobson, you've been working in the field of data for a decade now. And so can you speak about that increase in the exponential in increase in data um, and, and uh, like how has that definitely helped you in your job or how has that like any like privacy concerns and like the ethical questions that you have to ask about using such vast amounts of data? Right. Uh, the, well, that's a lot of, a lot of questions all rolled into one. So you, you can answer one at a time. Yeah. And then I'll, I'll just, uh, say them again. Um, yeah. No, that's all right. So I'll start with the, the overwhelming amount of data, the exponential growth in data. That's, um, uh, that's actually an, obviously an opportunity for, that's what has empowered AI. It gives us a lot of training data. Unfortunately, many of it, much of it is unstructured and unlabeled. So any of your students who have experience in actually training models will recognize that that's not nearly as valuable as the labeled data. But now with natural language processing and a lot of these pre-trained models, you can do transfer learning and then use that transfer learning of natural language models over to that data to extract actual structured data, get labels out of it uh, using these, these models that are actually even better than the kinds of labels that you would get out of humans uh, that you um, that you contract to on these, you know, mechanical Turk sort of systems at AWS or whatever to label your data. Uh, they're actually better. Um, they 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 do uh, cross validation of the system that after they've trained it on the data from the the people and and Bert and many other models that question answering like reading comprehension tests, um, read a paragraph, answer a question those models uh, surpass what humans can accomplish, what those same humans who labeled the training set were able to accomplish. The machine's able to get better efficiency than them, better, better accuracy by, by a couple percent. So like 93% are rel um, compared to 95% uh, accuracy. It's just, it's just amazing. So, um, and that's all open source and, um, and that's been empowered by the massive amount of accurate um, natural language text available from the Gutenberg project, from uh, Wikipedia, from uh, there's, there's a project for actually archiving the entire web. And so he, he, even, uh, even small companies like us can, um, can mine that data for, uh, for uh, structured data that we can use in the real world. That's also, and that brings me to the next part, sort of part of your question. That's an overwhelming amount of information for an individual or a small business to deal with um, uh, unless they can get into a form and have some assistance from some real an, an actual AI agent. So um, the, the process of structuring it, you need a data scientist to go through and, and, and figure out what kind of data you want to extract from the web out of these, you know, these terabytes and petabytes of data that are flowing. You got to figure out where in the world you need to get data from and that all requires human expertise. But if we had um, assistance, like we actually do, um, I don't, we, we don't really appreciate how powerful uh, cognitive assistant um, search engines are for us, and even home uh, virtual assistants are, these voice assistants that we have, but they are uh, quite um, augmenting to our capacity of our brains. Um, your generation may not appreciate this, but mine certainly does, where those that adopted that quickly, they seemed brilliant. <laughs> they seemed like, okay, these guys know what they're talking about because every single time you ask them a question, they'd email back with the exact right answer. And because they were using the tools that were available to them in, in terms of search engines. Um, unfortunately though, um, uh, that has turned from just the enthusiastic implementation that engineers are excited about where they're just trying to make it accurate and good and giving you the search results you want to turning into these mega corporations whose entire uh, self-worth, the CEOs, the managers, the all the way up and down the chain, even, even the engineers themselves, their self-worth is wrapped up in how much money it's generating. And so those, um, those systems are now, the utility function, for those of you that are actually training um, machine learning models, the utility function, the cost metric, whatever you wanna call it, that is optimized and incentivized for um, search results that aren't actually what you want. They're actually manipulating you and giving you uh, resources that are outside of the ones that you're actually searching for. Um, things like advertisements or even um, misinformation, propaganda, because, um, and you can see what a profound effect that's had on the world over the past five years as, as corporations have caught on to the power of this and have begun to, to use it against us as individuals 
to manipulate us and control our behavior. Uh, it's now, like I was talking about, you know, Burke can now read and answer questions from text better than we can. Um, uh, machines are now able to predict our behavior better than we know ourselves. They're able to know when you type something into that, that search bar, uh, they could provide you with a page that's even better than what you had imagined you were looking for on the web but they choose not to and instead provide you with what they know is going to trigger you. Trigger that, uh, that endorphin hit, trigger that uh, a dopamine hit and uh, keep you coming back. And usually it's not that same thing that's gonna give you a productive, happy life and uh, allow you to accomplish your goals. It's usually buying a product or getting you involved in some a uh, long chain of interaction on Facebook or, or something that's not nearly as productive as what you, what you could be. So we're trying to do, do just the opposite, of course, with our, our tools that we're providing to individuals and, and nonprofits. We're able to provide cognitive assistance and search um, that's actually answering the question that you ask uh, precisely and, and, and only the words that you need helping to filter out. We're building a product, for instance, um, uh, in anticipation of major news organizations needing it. Um, we are we're in the process of working with a, a news organization to put together a, uh, a system for um, uh, helping journalists um, uh, identify actual news in Twitter feeds um, and tweets uh, that are uh, several hours ahead of what's available on Reuters or any of the major uh, news uh, channels. This was done successfully five years ago uh, when I was at Sharp Labs, I saw a presentation by a company called um, Banja that successfully did this for financial uh, firms, FinTech. It was not designed to help people find good news stories. It was designed to help um, hedge funds make money off that uh, financially impact um, uh, data. So um, I'm five years late, but I'm going to bring that technology to, to us individuals so that we can have access to truth um, in the post-truth world. I guess uh, this is going. This is going into uh, into like into. I, I never mind. Uh, but uh, I guess. Uh, where were you, where are you gonna go? To, uh, well, well, I, I was planning on speaking more on like chatbots and like the, I guess like the good side of AI. But we can definitely talk about. Um, oh, no, we are talking about the good. Thing. I'm just like this cognitive yeah. system. Sorry. Okay, go for it. Uh, but I guess uh, relating to that like good and bad side of AI. Uh, do you think? It is like with the development of AI um, and then everything like with all the like the research papers and everything that we've done uh, in developing artificial intelligence. Do you think the, the good side outweighs like the, the, the bad side, like the use, uh, particularly as a way to find better ways to sell things to consumers or to uh, to uh, like, yeah, just to make more money. So, so uh, I guess what are your thoughts on, on that? And then, uh, yeah. It depends on what you think of as humanity's destiny. <laughs> Do you think of us as being happy lemmings um, who are well fed and live in a society where there's less disease? Then certainly the um, disease and, and suffering, um, there'll be certainly less of that. But there'll be a lot of mental, there is a lot more mental anxiety, but the, the, these AI systems are so, you know, curing cancer, um, they're eventually going to uh, help us cure for malaria and uh, genetic engineering, all these, you, know, you, can, you can read the 21 lessons of, of the 21st century by Yuval Harari if you want to get into all the, the benefits or, or listen to Freakonomics radio every now and then. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. What, we don't really appreciate how wonderfully comfortable, how less, how few, so many far fewer people die of violence every year. Um, uh, but um, that that comes with this cost that we are being manipulated in, in many cases to, uh, to accomplish that happiness. And it may not even be happiness, it's more of an addiction to our phones or whatever. But, um, but that's not necessarily what, what would be best for humanity as a species, because as you can see, that's, that's pl uh, it's a plague on the planet in terms of our exploitation of the planet. And, um, and so, uh, there is no right answer to that question. There is no better or worse. It's just different. Uh, AI has, has, has a lot of positive impact and a lot of negative impact in the world. 
And it's simply a matter of the more people who do good, then the more good there will be in the world. And the more people who are intent on using it for bad, then the more there will be bad in the world. Uh, but I can hear in the, in the back of your brain the thought, okay, but what happens when we are the subjects of AI, when we are, when we are no longer um, controlling AI, when we no longer as individuals have a choice, when we are have lost our ability to, to manipulate it and it's manipulating us, uh, even outside of those people who funded it. But um, I, I think the, the concept of that super intelligence has, is already here. Um, it's just not in a single room or single server farm or a single uh, person's brain, uh, but machines as a whole and the network of, you know, Intelligence itself exists in the connections between um, neurons or between people or between brains or between like the intelligence of an anthill is far greater than the intelligence of that individual ant. And, um, and it actually works as an organism in the world to accomplish very intelligent, complex behaviors from altruism to, to uh, uh, everything. And so, uh, and likewise, human society, when we work together, we send people to the moon or to Mars and, uh, and even interstellar probes out beyond the, the, the solar pause. We can do great things together and, and very intelligent things that in our individual brains simply aren't able to accomplish. And that's all mediated by AI. Um, all these search algorithms, all these, um, uh, all these data science models that we create, all these uh, weather models and everything we're doing uh, in the world is mediated and, and, and empowered. And uh, it, it's possible only because of data science, AI, natural language processing, chatbots, all of that stuff. It's definitely um, a much more different response uh, to, to the idea that like, will AI ever take over uh, like, our ability, to, uh, like our ability to control things, etc. Um, like I've never, I've never heard quite a response like that before. It's either no AI will continue to be, I guess, controlled by us, like the subject of humans, uh, because if we feed them data, we we control that amount of data, so they can't possibly uh, be, become like smarter than us. Or or the on the other side, with the I guess more more uh, like Terminator-esque uh, people who, who think that AI will control the world, like with Skynet and stuff. Um, and so bef before I move on, I guess we can take a quick break and see uh, if anyone in the audience has any questions uh, for Hobson or Maria. Uh, you can either unmute yourself or just send it in chat. Yeah, I love that. I'll, I'll just briefly say something. The uh, I love that analogy of the Skynet. Um, uh, people are imagining a Terminator or, uh, or a, an army of Terminators showing up, but instead uh, Skynet, or Skynet um, has already arrived and it's embedded in all of our brains. We're all cyborgs now. We're all addicted to our phones. We're all um, playing by the whims of Skynet now. Uh, we're just, we're just uh, not as... Um, self-aware as we should be about it. All right. Um, I guess there's no questions right now. Oh, okay, never mind. So Jason, if you want to unmute yourself or I can, uh, or if Hobson, you can, you can read the chat so you can uh, answer it. Oh, what do you think about AI that codes its own program? Wow, that's, um, that's becoming a possibility. Uh, code quality or quality code. There's a, there's a company that uh, develops systems for um, helping uh, coders do code review. And it, of course, they're building up a huge database of labeled database of, of this code works, this code doesn't, this code is Pythonic, this code is not. And, um, and they're doing a really, really good job of actually providing um, code review and feedback. And it won't be long before a code that is able to, to write its own code is possible. Um, that's, um, uh, but if you think about it, uh, systems like um, uh, robot, uh, data robot and auto ML at, at Google, those systems already do code their own code. They, uh, they decide which model to, to, to use. They decide which data processing to do. They try all the possibilities. Yeah, it's, it's kind of dumb. It's kind of like playing chess in the early days where you just try all the moves in your head and figure out which ones are going to work. 
but um, but they're getting better. Just like they got better at Go, they're getting better at this. And and some and these and these models, these uh, these systems that program a machine learning pipeline and then can auto autonomously push a button and deploy to a cellular phone, and have that model incorporated into an actual product. That's already here, and those those systems are producing models that are uh, far out performing those models that can be handcrafted. Um, so as fast as Google and others can do it, they're putting together systems that, that whenever they come up with an idea of a kind of product, that, whether it's a chatbot or whatever, um, they are making systems that are push button deployable to accomplish those particular applications, whether it's a healthcare diagnosis bot or a um, uh, customer service chatbot, or as recently they demonstrated, someone that can a, a, a chatbot that can actually synthesize voice and, and make a telephone call to make uh, restaurant reservations. I guess on that note, uh, do you think these models that are able to program, like essentially, uh, if you type in like some uh, some like CS related problem, like sort this list uh, by blah blah blah. And then, uh, and then the, the the model essentially splits out a algorithm or for uh, to do that. Uh, do you see that this will be the extinction of uh, of programmers? Or like, I know this is quite a stupid question, uh, but I just want to get your thoughts on. Yeah, um, it's not a stupid uh, question at all. People are working on it. It's a uh, it's a very very reasonable path. And, and yes, I, I think it is possible that that will become a thing. And we already are doing it. We, ha we already have autocomplete. So you start to give it a thought, you start to describe the code with actual code itself, and it can autocomplete it for you. Sure, it's baby steps, but uh, it's getting there. And just as you can play the middle button game on your phone with autocomplete, you can do the same with code. And, um, and yes, those, mo those language models of code They've, that's only recently, the people have been, in, um, you know, BERT only came out in the fall of last year to achieve these sort, and GPT-2 the year before that, um, and GPT-3 more recently. And those are the models that really blew people's minds. We thought that it was impossible to compose a paragraph of fictional text that was actually compelling, and but those models did it. Um, and so it, it's not unreasonable to assume that as soon as those experts at Google and, other, and elsewhere turn their expertise on the problem of generating code lines, it should actually be an easier problem than generating um, natural language text, except for the fact that natural language text doesn't need to be correct. It only need, it doesn't, it's a bit more brittle, but the grammar uh, and the syntax of natural, of, of code is much more well-defined, obviously com fully defined in a compiler. And so you can, um, so it's just a matter of uh, them changing their emphasis from solving the game of Go to solving the game of this finite state machine that is the grammar of a, a coding language and um, being able to translate from natural language very fuzzy into that, um, uh, and it's just a matter of time. They've been able to translate from, from, uh, from one language to another, even from very, uh, very different languages like the hieroglyphic language of, um, of Chinese or Egyptian and, and, and ancient Egyptian. And yet, and, and so they, it won't be long before they're able to translate between much less from that fuzzy world into the much more concrete world of, of computer languages. But the complexity of those systems. So uh, writing, writing a function, writing a, um, uh, an individual uh, Lambda function or even you know, a more complex function, that's not, Programming, <laughs> programming. The hard part of programming is deciding what function you need, and what's the best combination of functions. And can I, should I incorporate them into some sort of object or some sort of hierarchical structure? Uh, and is, is functional programming the right way to go with this, or is object-oriented programming the right way to go with this? The architecture, and uh, I don't see that happening within the next ten to twenty years. But um, uh, I. I uh, can't imagine that it's impossible, just as they beat us at, at the game of Go and much more higher level thinking than we thought was possible in the past. It won't be long before they're helping us there, but they will be our assistants at first and we'll be, and that will feed back on itself as it always has. And there'll be ex exponential growth in its capability. Um, nobody can predict the future. All right. Uh, I guess there's another question in the chat. If you want to read that. How can we use AI to solve the mental health problems that AI caused in the first place? 
wow, you came to the right place. That's, that's Maria and, and my uh, passion. Um, it's, uh, well, that's what AI was proposed for even back in the 60s. Uh, the first chatbot for our mental health assistance was Eliza in the 1960s. And it was, um, it, uh, they, that, if you don't, uh, obviously none of you would been, a, even your parents might not have um, uh, been adults at that time and, and been aware of the, the, the times, but uh, TV was a thing. And addiction to TV was a real concern. And, uh, and then they were saw these computers come online and they were starting to be fearful of computers. And, uh, and so they were preparing for that with these chatbots that could help people with their mental health problems. There was already a lot of concern about the addiction to, to television back then. But anyway, so our, our use of technology to deal with the psychological impact of technology on us as a species is, 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 has a long history. Um, Maria and I are working on uh, chatbots that can help with imposter syndrome, for, for example. Your students might be very interested in that. We're working with Jomo Bolos and, um, uh, did I pronounce that name correctly, uh, uh, Maria? Um, uh, sh she's, uh, she and Maria are working at, um, at, a, at a college to develop a program that involves both chatbots as well as incorporated into uh, a normal sort of workshop uh, program to help students and and those uh, suffering from imposter syndrome, those from disadvantaged com communities that don't feel like they are belong in, a, in the tech world or wherever, um, help them deal with that stress. And, and those sorts of bots are available um, as therapy. I don't know if you've seen Wobot on, that's been around for several years on Facebook. Um, uh, a mind current was a bot that we were working on to do that as well. Um, they went away from the chatbot sort of approach and they went with the more uh, curated content and um, basically video clips, to, uh, uh, tiny little um, uh, videos of, from a uh, psycho psychologist or a therapist to help people with uh, various issues. Um, you know, breathe, calm, uh, all the meditation apps, they're all designed to help coach us and help us deal with this overwhelming anxiety that we all feel as a result of this information flood and all the things outside of our circle of influence that have a huge impact on our lives, like COVID-19 and the politics, domestic politics in, in North America, et cetera. I guess on that note with Eliza, as you mentioned um, earlier, uh, could you speak on the uh, evolution of chatbots throughout the years? So I know Eliza, if you search up uh, pictures now, uh, it look, it's, it's very much terminal based. It does not look uh, that user friendly. Uh, especially uh, as it is terminal based and has no uh, real images. But uh, could you speak on that evolution of like how far chatbots have come uh, all the way from Eliza to now? Um, I know Facebook has API specifically for chatbots so you can implement them into your website, et cetera. Right. Um, so you're interested more on the technology side or sort of just the, the capability and UX of it? Um, I guess we could talk about both, but uh, okay. I, I think it would be uh, from the from the UX side. Uh, now nah, we can talk from the technical side. I think that would be more. Is, it, is the audience here? Are, are we mostly software developers? Are you you're, you're working on a hackathon project? Are you programming in Python or those sorts of languages? Are you building actual chatbots or machine learning models? For I think the audience can answer that. Um, but like for, for the hackathon, I think, yes, we, we are mostly all uh, software developers. Okay, wonderful. So, so those early chatbots were just if-then statements. Uh, they would extract the, the most interesting. Eliza was a, a bot that used reflexive therapy where you extract the most emotionally loaded word as you can from, and it had a list of those words, a simple list of ASCII characters that um, contained emotional words. And then it would reflect back uh, to you that word, it would reuse that word and make it think that it, you under, that it understood it by asking you more about it, just like a therapist would do in a normal therapy session. It, it was able to, to fool uh, people back in, in that time because they weren't familiar with what chatbots were, were doing. But it didn't take long for, for young people to catch on and realize, oh, this is not some human. They're obviously, they, to, to fool it, to, to take it outside of what the normal protocol would be in a therapy session and, and actually ask it questions that would make it difficult to answer, uh, as you found. And so um, 
Uh, but then there was this AI winter because we couldn't figure out how in the world are we going to build AI with these sort of expert systems that are trained by a human expert to make if then decisions and a decision tree and then come down to a final conclusion uh, in order to, to, to deal with um, difficult situations. Uh, but our, you know, the edge cases. Um, and so we started to bring in some of those edge cases to what we're doing and, and realize it can't do it. Uh, so neural networks were, were a thing even back then, um, but they weren't, we didn't have the data nor the, um, the processing capacity to take advantage of them. So there was a real um, disappointment and the AI winter happened. Later uh, though, um, the, the, there was a resurgence as they were used um, in the dot-com craze. Um, people probably oversold them. Uh, could you hold on a minute? I need to close the door. It sounds like there's been a noise. Yep, no worries. Yeah, that's better. Um, so, um, so they did try again, uh, not only with neural networks, but with more conventional data science, statistical models, Bayesian models. But then again, uh, the, but then after the dot com crash, people realized, oh, that was just a bunch of um, BS. Like you'd appreciate this for the image processing, they would they would try to classify images, uh, especially for in the military context where they're trying to classify this as either a, a tank or a truck or a, a person or whatever in, in the forest. Uh, from satellite imagery or from uh, airplane imagery, overflight imagery, and they were seeing, and it was getting a really high accuracy um, until they figured out that all of the images that they were showing of tanks were at night when those tanks were moving around, and all the images they were showing of cars and normal everyday activity was happening during the day, and so the machine was just learning night and day, and uh, was really, and and so uh, it was many years later in the the, the 21st century. When um, in uh, 20, around 20, 2008, I guess it was, uh, when Hinton and, and his crew came up with CNNs, and that brought in, that ushered in the, the, this golden age of AI that we're in now, where we can now build neural networks that are able to recognize patterns that are um, spatially um, invariant, uh, uh, translational in invariants, uh, rotational invariants, uh, recognize combinations of eyes and noses and mouths and edges and uh, circles and and put them all together into a pattern that can be recognized as a face or whatever. And, um, and so that has, you know, they've been able to generalize, uh, and of course, GPUs and processing power in general has uh, exploded. Um, and then we have more data sets, uh, especially with the internet, we've now been able to label data sets. So people are constantly labeling uh, their data sets just by describing the images that are out there. So that those data sets then make it possible to train these systems. So the, the current, and, and for, um, for natural language processing um, uh, that and chatbots, those things are, um, let me think about the, the, the major developments there. So um, chatbots in uh, the Leibniz, Leib, Leibniz Prize in, um, in, in the UK was all about uh, uh, accomplishing the Turing test essentially. Um, uh, and ever since, uh, uh, for, for decades, people have been trying to get better and better at the, at the problem of fooling uh, uh, professional judges, judges who've been trained to recognize chatbots behavior and ask the right questions. Uh, so people have been trying harder and harder that. And only three years or three or four years ago, there was a chatbot that actually, uh, Misuki or something, uh, developed by uh, an academic, uh, um, an individual. Uh, in, in that world, I was able to, to fool more than half of the judges or, or some, whatever the threshold was that they had set for, for winning the prize. And um, it, was, it was quite successful. But then they, did, they moved the goalpost. So now you're, it's not okay to play like you're dumb and play like you are a Russian uh, immigrant who does not have full control of the language like they did in that particular uh, competition. And so their key, uh, our idea of what it takes to be a good chatbot is getting better and better. And as generations like yours come into the field and uh, are, are more savvy, uh, you know, digital natives who are more savvy about all that, um, we're having to, to move those goalposts even further to, to deal with um, your ability to detect trolling and all the other things that you have to deal with online and being able to recognize a bot from a human. Um, Y'all are very good at it. All right, I guess before I ask um, my, my last question that I've prepared, um, do any of you guys have uh, any questions that you want to ask Hobson? I know uh, Yogi, I told you that we would 
uh, that the talk would only be for about 45 minutes. So uh, are we able to squeeze in like one or two more questions? Yeah, I'm available until you're done. All right. I guess we can just give uh, some people time to type. First time hearing about AI, Jason Lynn. Interesting. When do you think AI began? So, uh, I think that's, that goes all the way back in, to the 19th century, at least, and, and probably much before that, Isaac Asimov and all the great authors were, were dreaming of AI and even building mechanical systems. The, it, it goes back to the first mechanical computer, actually. Uh, I think the Sumerians even had a, a system for developing a mechanical system to, to do computation. Uh, and replace humans at a task that they thought was only possible by humans doing math. Um, and so it's been around ever since we've been, it depends on what you call AI. Certainly not artificial general intelligence wasn't on the books back then, but. I guess if we have uh, no more questions, uh, like just like my last question that I wanna ask you, uh, and then we can close it from there. Uh, by the way, Hobson, if you have, if you want to like send any links uh, about changeable AI, so like the audience can uh, find out more or or any or any promotional uh, materials <laughs> you want to send. I appreciate um, that. Uh, but I guess so. Uh, this this is not uh, like strictly just for AI. But do you see any emerging fields in tech or AI uh, that you think will like revolutionize the world or change how we do things? Uh, such as the the internet or uh, right now I know uh, many say blockchain is quite big um, so, so uh, working in industry do you see any any potential fields that would like change how we do things well obviously um, self-driving cars and AI itself I mean just just the concept of AI and cognitive assistance um, being able to embed it in your brain uh, um, biotech being able to augment and, uh, and genetically engineer your brain as well as your body. Um, all those are, are rapidly transforming what it means to be human. Please read uh, 21 Lessons for the 21 Century by, um, by Yuval Harari. He's got many more ideas and he talked to many more experts than I could ever begin to go into. Um, there are so many uh, transformative technologies that have been made possible by AI itself automation and being able to have assistants that are giving us uh, leveraging our brain power and expanding our brain power and helping us connect to one another and share our brain power and coordinate our brain power. All of that is just transformational on society. Uh, of course, the, the near term transformation is going to happen as self-driving cars come online and people no longer have to purchase a car or um, when Uber and, um, and, and the, not, not to mention the, um, uh, the the jobs, the the economic singularity that will happen as a result of that, you know, five percent of the population no longer having a job immediately. We'll get we're getting a preview of that with COVID nineteen as people are um, in the service industry are are not having jobs, but uh, in, in large numbers. But uh, we're going to have to. It's going it, to the whole concept of government and capitalism and everything that we do is transforming on a yearly basis now, and um, you don't have to wonder about what is going to be the next thing you can, you can you're watching it happen right now all right i guess um that's that's it i guess like this could be the last call for any questions uh, the audience have uh, if you guys think of anything uh, after this call i guess you could uh send me it over on discord and then i can send you an email hobson uh for for you to answer if you if you have time of course um, so ten, I, I left the link to Tangible AI in our careers page there. So uh, feel free to, to check us out. Um, and um, we will be happy to, to talk to you more in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Janessa and Darren. Y'all have a good day. All right. It was a pleasure uh, to meet you, Kevin. Yep, you too, Maria. Um, Hobson, I'll send you over the recording uh, to your email, or, or I'll tell Yogia to send you uh, the recording.
All right. Sounds good. See you guys. Have a great day. Bye.